Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be having a conversation with Jennifer Pierce. Jennifer is the founder of Prosperity Dental Practice. She's also a coach and a speaker, and she's really grown up in the dental industry. She had her first job in a practice, starting in a lowly position, graduating through the ranks up to practice manager, and ultimately to practice ownership as a non-dentist owner. There's nothing that she doesn't know about how to really make the practice rock and roll. And everything she talks about is through lessons that come through real world experience, in the trenches experience. This is not theory. This is not textbook stuff. This is everything that's hard fought from the trenches. So I know you're going to really enjoy this conversation with Jennifer. She's going to talk about what she's done in her own practice to really help it stand out, to help it scale up, and to make it really positively impact the community it's part of and i really know that you're going to get some practical tips so please as always have a pen handy you're going to want to take some notes and put them into place straight away on monday morning so without any further ado here's the wonderful jennifer pierce jennifer pierce welcome to the savvy dentist podcast thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and hang with us how's things all the way in fort worth in texas they are doing wonderful thank you so much for having me Oh, look, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a little while because your story in dentistry is in its own way quite unique. I know all of our stories have unique threads to it, but your story is a really interesting one because it seems to me, after reading your bio and having conversations with you, it seems to me you've almost been born into dentistry. You've spent a fair bit of time around the profession doing all sorts of different wonderful things. But I'm I'm really curious, could you... Walk us through a little bit about your story. Was it a childhood passion or did it evolve organically? How did you find your way into dentistry? Well, actually, my best friend from high school married a dentist. She was a dental assistant, married a dentist, and went to work for him after they were married. And it was quite a stressor on their marriage. He and I had become friends. We'd been couple friends. And He came to me one day and said, my marriage isn't going to survive us working together. Would you consider coming and being my office manager? I knew nothing about dentistry, and I looked at him like he was crazy, but I wanted to save their marriage and help them. So I jumped in with both feet and became an office manager 22 years ago. Wow. Okay. So there's been been some changes in 22 years, right? There has, yes. Okay, so what do you think over those 22 years have been the significant changes that you've observed in that time? Well, insurance was not near the big bad demon that it is today for many people. We barely billed insurance when I initially came into dentistry. We didn't have anything to do with bigger dentistry. I think a lot of people refer to it as corporate dentistry. We were a small practice, one doctor, one hygienist when we started out. And over the years, I managed five to six dental practices until I came to be a practice co-owner, which I'm doing right now. To say things in dentistry are changing at warp speed is a bit of an understatement to me today. The first 15 years, I could pretty much predict outcomes and measure KPIs and pretty much be on target. In the last five to six years, I do not believe that that still holds true. Marketing is a huge thing for dental practices to have to embrace today. 22 years ago, it was tacky and we didn't do it. So if I had to say probably one thing that I think has been the biggest game changer, in my opinion, is the fact that people have to know where to find you to come and experience the the service that you're trying to deliver in your dental practice. Yeah, I think once upon a time, marketing was indeed a bit tacky and there was always a little bit of a, I suppose, the, the thought that people would look down their nose at you if you indeed did market, but now it's a necessity of modern dental practice and marketing is everywhere. And in fact, there's a great saying that marketing is everything and everything is marketing. And I 
think that's very true for dentists as much as anything. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about was, again, your journey is very remarkable and you spent a lot of time as an office manager before transitioning to ownership. But during that time, you were responsible for really lifting the performance of the practices that you worked in. There's a big uptick in that performance. I'm really curious to understand when you went into that first practice and then you were operating across multi, multiple centers at once, what were the key factors that you felt were responsible for seeing that uptick in performance? And I suppose what's relevant in today's market as well. And specifically, you know, what had you seen that had been broken that needed to be fixed along the way? My first practice that I started managing, I just had to dive in and really learn the, the, the basics of dentistry. So I didn't really fully understand the value of the education I received until years later. The first thing that I learned was how important your hygienist is in the treatment of periodontal disease. We didn't refer out our periodontics. We had a phase contrast microscope and we plaque sampled all our patients. We did all of our perio in-house and we did all of our, what I would consider bread and butter dentistry in-house at the time. We did not refer out. I think that's a big deal for practices. I think that the dentist being very competent, confident in his skill set leads the team to be able to mimic that with their leader. I believe in cohesive teams, which historically tend to be more women than men, of course, usually a male leader. In my practice management, I always partnered with my dentist. I believed that he and I were shoulder to shoulder in everything that we did. And anything that we presented to staff, patients, all of the above. And I always came in with an owner mentality. We, we, the ship came up together, the ship goes down together, and that's the way I always ran my teams. It is the way that I still do it today. When I went into managing a practice that was one of six group practices, it was a whole different dynamic from solo practitioner. I took the same philosophy and applied it into my one practice that I managed. When I took it over, it was the lowest producing practice at the time, kind of out in the hidden suburb, not in Dallas or a city, big city proper. And again, just proved a team that goes in together with skilled clinicians is what patients need. So it built it and it became the number one producing office in three years for this group setting. So I think we all hear it's teamwork, it's dentist, it's the dentist skill set, it's the team skill set, and it is every one of those, but it's also a whole team mindset. And I think that's becoming more well-known today than ever in the past. I think everybody's realizing that Every cog in the wheel has to be healthy and functioning in a small business environment, which I believe that is what dentistry is, in order for it to be prosperous and move forward. Um, Otherwise, I think it becomes stagnant. Yeah, look, there's a couple of really wonderful pieces of wisdom you've shared already. I just want to pick up some of those threads. It's a bit like a loose thread on a jumper and and unravel that and see where we end up, if, if that's cool. But what I'm curious to understand is the whole of team mentality because sometimes when I've walked into dental practices, and and you and I do similar work in terms of the practices that we help, but some of the practices I've walked into, it feels a little bit like there's islands. So you've got your front desk island that is separate to the clinical island that might be separate to the sterilization island and then the, the practitioner island. And sometimes it feels like there's these individual teams working under one roof, but not necessarily clicking together as, as you might hope. I guess what I'm trying to understand is how would you describe that one team mentality? And then in a practical sense, how do you move from being a team of individuals or individual teams to bring cohesion into that whole of team approach? It's interesting you just said that. I was not aware that there was division between the front, the back, the sterilization until about six months ago when I kind of brought my head up out of my own practices and my own work. And then I realized that this was a disconnect happening in many practices. I've never experienced that. 
So in my practices, it was never that way. But now that I'm aware of that happening in practices, I can see where that occurs. I believe it occurs because you don't have one person that really drives the bus and makes everything intended around that that team. And the person driving the bus can't have any agenda in it other than this is the bus and this is the way we're going. And that's the doctor and the office manager, practice manager. You know, I hear many different terms, but they basically, they have to set the culture, set the tone, and everybody buys into the the vision of the practice, of course, and moves it forward. Some of my staff members have been with me for over 10 years. They were co-workers with me before they became employees of mine, but they don't feel like employees. They're my team. And I've never differentiated between an assistant, a sterilization tech, a hygienist, or a doctor. We are all in the boat together, rowing the same direction, regardless of title, regardless of education, regardless of, regardless of pay scale. And when you've had employed dentists, for instance, has that ever come up to be a bit of an issue? Because, again, we are speaking to dentists on this particular show, and so I'm really conscious of not wanting to offend anyone. But certainly when I've seen some larger group practices before, there's potentially one dentist who, who might feel that, you know, I'm a dentist. And good, goodness knows, I, I feel that there's a certain amount of cachet that goes with that. How do you deal with that situation? Or is it just that they're not the right culture fit for your practice? And does it come back to recruiting the right people? If it's in a group practice setting, what you're saying is the way that I handled it was the dentist and the team were all brought together and I said, you know, we're all going to do this together. And of course, that doesn't mean that dis- the dentist is is shown any disrespect. It's, a, it's actually quite the opposite. The team is taught that he basically should walk into a room and everything should just be laid out and fine tuned and you should be a step ahead of your, your dentist as an assistant and make things flow. So when a dentist has that, they relax. They relax into their ability. And so does the hygienist because the hygienist feels supported and the assistant feels respected because she's enabled to do her best work. So I did have one dentist in my group setting that it, it, he didn't have the ability to kind of flow into the, the vision and the culture I was envisioned for my group setting. And I and I did have to sit him down and say, you know, this this is only going to work if we do it this way. And he decided that it wasn't fitful for for him. And I said, I, I agree and I understand and, and I wish you very much luck. And that's where that's actually it's kind of funny. That's when I hired <laughs> my now business partner. He became the dentist to replace that dentist. And then we organically vetted each other in that office over three years working together. And then we became partners. See, isn't that serendipitous? What a wonderful serendipity. Yes. And he and I are so profoundly grateful for that. And it's why we work so well together. Today, he does nothing but show up and work on our patients. He does nothing else. And, and coming back to the dentist that left, I, I just want to be really clear about this just in case I've created a conception or an idea in the mind of the audience here. The person who left the practice, there's nothing wrong with that particular person. It's just not the right fit. And no, so yeah. some right, of the times right. when we, we view these people as not being the right fit for us or, or us not being the right fit for them, it's not a matter of someone being a bad person at all. It's just a square peg and round hole scenario and trying to make sure that everyone gels together and moves in the right direction together. And that really only happens when there's that good culture fit. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that a hundred percent. And there was no animosity or hard feelings. It was just, this is where we're going. And, and that wasn't part of where he wanted to go. And, and there was a lot of respect and then it was just time to move on. Perfect. Perfect. So as you went through that journey and you were working across multiple practices and different locations, because some of the dentists listening to this particular program I know have multiple practices across multiple locations. And it sometimes feels a little bit like they're juggling quite a few balls at once. And again, I know that comes back to having a really good key person to work with. But from your perspective, 
working across multiple locations in that office manager role, what processes did you need to have in place or how did you keep things in order and the whole group moving in the one direction without feeling like you're playing that game whack-a-mole when you, you know, you've got one little problem over <laughs> here and you, you put that one out and then another one arises over there. You remember that game? So how, yes. how, did, how, did you, how did you go about that process? I think that you it, it starts with when the treatment's closed, the treatment plan laid out extensive notes that everybody can understand as, the, as you're moving patient through treatment. That's number one. Number two, I think that a person kind of owning that responsibility, when they come in, they've got to check those notes, make sure their doctor's set up for success. They know their next steps. And then the patient, the analogy I always use is I'm like, the patient is our raw egg. And we're passing this patient through our building, through our practice. And we don't want to ever drop that raw egg. And that makes the doctor feel comfortable because he knows everybody's checking this. So I think the whack-a-mole thing happens a little bit more predominantly when the dentist feels like he's the only one doing that. And that's a lot to keep up with. And he doesn't know how to go back and check the, the financials and, and what's next and where we are. It's enough for him to come in and do the clinical dentistry to not drop the egg. So each person really owning their role is of paramount importance. And I think we hear this a lot on different podcasts and on Facebook and that kind of thing. Doing and saying are two different subjects. And training and empowering are two different subjects. Understanding and integration are two different subjects, in my opinion. So that's a really good point. In fact, it, I was having a conversation with someone just yesterday, one of the people that works in my office, and we were talking about the learning and training versus the integration and having had a, a run many workshops myself and attended many workshops myself, we're on this constant journey to think about how can we ensure that the material that we teach is integrated fully into practice. So I'm really curious to understand from your perspective how do you integrate versus train? What, where do you see the real rubber hitting the road in terms of being able to send your team to a training event and then having them come back and implement and have that integrated into daily practice? Where do you see uh, the, the key learnings in that? Well, that's kind of what made me start my new venture is I've been in dental offices where they've, they've actually two offices when I was hired, they had coaches and consultants already in the practice. So I came in and saw what they were trying to implement. And I went to my dentist and I said, you know, we can do this. I can do this. We, we've got to integrate all this into the practice, but I need to know what you want. What do you want to integrate? Let's say they've given us 20 things. Do you want to do all 20 or do you want to do five? Or maybe we pick five and we master five and we really make it part of our culture before we move forward with it. So I believe that they go to doctors can go to many different CEs and, and all that kind of thing and bring it back. And, and, and it kind of just dumps on the staff and the staff just kind of has that glazed over look. And then the doctor <laughs> feels like it's mutiny on the bounty and he just submits and doesn't do anything. Yeah. Well, my whole philosophy is integration is the only way to make it happen. Otherwise it is going to fail. So my concept is to have an integrator. You have to have an integrator come in and feel as one with the office. They're going to have to, the staff's going to have to feel comfortable with them. The doctor has to know that they're there for the doctor to help him with his vision and to move things forward. And then integration is a process that is set up in processes. So you'll see a lot of people that'll do like, they want to integrate the front office. Then they want to integrate the back office, like what you were saying. I don't think it can be done that way. This is my my own opinion. I think it has to be very all in one. I think it has to be done all at one time. And I think everybody has to be shown to crawl and walk and run as a team. I really love that. I think that integration piece is really wonderful. And for anyone listening, I hope you take some great notes because Jennifer is sharing some absolute profound wisdom and I would really encourage you to, as a team, look at that integration. And as Jennifer has said, as a team, learning to crawl, walk, and run together. 
rather than segregating your team into different islands. And again, Jennifer, I think that's really wonderful and profound advice. I do want to talk a little bit about, again, working across these multiple locations because when you were working in that office manager role, what is it that at that time, perhaps your owner was really wonderful, I'm sure he or she was, but were there things that you wished more broadly that owners would know about how to work best with their office manager? I'll be perfectly honest. My The owner of these six dental practices was a retired dentist, was a CEO that I saw once a week. I only saw him once a week and I reported directly to him. That gave me the most carte blanche and the most built me the most in my forward thinking and independence than anything I've ever, ever experienced in dentistry. It's what led me to hope to want to become a practice owner because one-on-one with him, I would tell him of my, my own pain points, my own struggles. And then he would make me suggestions and he would say, what do you think is going to work in you know that situation? And he wouldn't tell me. He'd coach you coach me and I'd go back and I would try and I would see success or I would see failure and I could do an autocorrect and the autocorrect is where we we grow you know we we don't learn by succeeding we only learn by failing unfortunately we fail first my one of my favorite sayings is I've always been willing to show up and suck before I knew I was going to show up and shine and that has served me profoundly in my business life and also in my personal life because I don't care if I look stupid at first. I don't want to look stupid because I didn't ask. So I think that's probably where it helped me the most because I would come back and I would say, okay, I'm facing this, this, and this. There would be recommendations and he would say, you know, what do you think you should do? And I was like, well, I'm going to go do this and off I'd go. And I could do course correction in a week because I could go back and say, well, well, that didn't work. And then I tried this and then I could get course correction very rapidly. Yeah. So again, it's fail fast is the, is the old credo that we hear. So Absolutely. You know, take action, see what works and then take corrective action if that's required. So coming back to the audience at the moment who will be listening, there'll be predominantly dentists, perhaps maybe some office managers. And I know the office managers are going to be screaming out down the earphone <laughs> saying, make sure you say this, Jennifer, tell them this because they need to know it. <laughs> so what what is it that you think you would like dentists to know about how to get the most out of their office manager and how to work with them and how to be effective as a team? Well, okay. Since I'm in Texas, I'm going to use a term that everybody may not be familiar with, but in in the world of cattle raising, there's a wonderful thing called a bell cow, and it means it's the cow that brings everybody in and kind of saves the rancher work and herds up the cows and and everybody trusts that person. And in dentistry, what I've seen over the years is friends of mine who would have been fabulous practice managers, office managers, those kind of things, were not trusted and empowered by the dentist to create the culture that the dentist wanted. I think there's a lot of fear from dentists in having not complete control. (laughs) That would be the understatement of the century. I'm so sorry if that's like politically incorrect. (laughs) Go for it. But if you really have the right bell cow, office manager, practice manager, whatever, it's it 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 it's kind of like a marriage at work. I get that, but I don't mean that in in any way to be true. But you become partners with your office manager, your practice manager, and you should be a united front. Sometimes the dentist isn't the best leader. Sometimes he is a little introvert and he really likes the clinical aspects. He would highly benefit from a strong office manager. And I'm not saying that this happens overnight, but it's a vetting process that I think happens when two people realize they have the same vision and they really want it to work. So if you have a real strong leader dentist, and he just needs somebody to really close treatment and be a task oriented person for him, then that's a strong office manager for that person. I think that you have to fit it to the dentist. You have to find the office manager, practice manager that fits that dentist. Historically, mine have been 
great clinicians, great guys, a little tired of running the whole, the whole show of a dental practice. When I came in, they almost got to relax a little bit. Yeah. And then they could go nerd out on their CE on learning, you know, implants and all on four and things like that. And that really stoked them. And that's good. That's what you want. You want your dentist stoked and hyped and wanting to deliver dentistry because then that has a trickle down effect onto their team. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I'm also really curious to understand is because you are a, an owner of a dental practice without being a dentist, which is not entirely common. It's certainly not unheard of, but it's not common. I'm curious to understand your transition to practice ownership because that might have thrown up some obviously opportunities but perhaps some challenges and I'm wondering how that transition was for you and what perspectives you are able to bring to the practice as a non-dentist owner can you walk us through some of the things you've learned in that journey yeah it's a lot I thought I understood the pain points of my dentists in the past as their practice manager when you become an owner you then really understand all the pain points. I, I truly <laughs> can say I've locker. got that T-shirt. There's so many. There's, you know, there's financial, there's HR, there's all those things. I've always done HR. I've always done the hiring, the firing before I was a practice owner. I, I really did do a lot of those things. The things that changed for me were now I have relationships with our bankers. I, I really understand sales reps and the motivation of a sales rep from dentist perspective. I understand meeting payroll. That's a whole new level of stress for people, especially starting out. People don't understand business ownership until they've laid awake at night wondering about a payroll. And I've been there, done that, got that t-shirt. Because when you're brand new, you're just brand new. You just, you're just juggling and trying to figure things out. So would I trade it? Not in a million years, not in a million years would I trade my journey, but I'm a very empathetic, but authoritative owner. And I'm fiercely, fiercely defend this profession and dentist now. Fantastic. So as you've gone on your journey, I, I often joke with people I work with that being a parent is a crash course in personal growth, but <laughs> a close second is running a business. You know, there, there's yeah. a lot of growth that comes in that. There's the old saying that got your comfort zone and growth is immediately outside of that. And, and so I'm curious as you've gone through your journey, the personal growth that you might have had to have encounter, things you, skills you've had to learn, but more importantly, who did you need to grow into as a leader, as a business owner? What sort of skills and attributes did you need to hone and develop in that journey? Because again, you've had incredible business growth and it's my view that the business will never outgrow the leader. So you must have been growing as well. So what was your growth trajectory like in terms of the skills or the attributes you needed to acquire to become the best owner that you could be? I think I'm a perpetual student. There's not any time I'm not reading, listening to audiobooks on any number of subjects. I believe in diversification of your knowledge. I think if you only stay in the dental world to learn dental business, you, you set yourself up for failure somewhat. Probably, yes, I'm, I'm a single mother on top of all this. So when my son was heading to college is when I decided I could take this on. I could take on being an owner now because I had the, the effort and the time. I'm incredibly fearless. And I, I don't know if that's birth or learning. I, I truly don't. But there's just times that you have to just learn to tell people, no, I'm not doing that right now. And it makes you laser focus your intentions your mission, your vision, when you have people who depend on you. It's like raising children. You take that you take that role seriously because they're your babies. But it's kind of becomes the same thing when you have a team and you love your team and you're you're on a you're on a good trajectory and y'all are moving forward and making progress. You don't want to let them down either. Staying ahead of that curve is a perpetual item that you have to do. And I read somewhere that the average CEO reads 60 books a year. And that's, a, that's an investment. You've got to really work to be able to do that when you're also living your life. But 
knowledge is the most wonderful thing because once you have it in your head, you can't take it back. You have to act on it. And the people you surround yourself with who get that, because when you're a little weird on the like visionary scale, I'm more of a visionary, most definitely, you realize you have to be around people who are like you. Otherwise, people just think you're a little nuts <laughs> and that's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should probably hang out a whole lot more. Um, <laughs> I, I get that loud and clear. So again, Jennifer, obviously lots of growth, and where there's growth, there's obviously a few errors and missteps, and I suppose oh, yeah. mix-ups. Or I'm trying to sound polite here, but obviously things don't always go to plan. So where in your journey have you made boo-boos? Where have you mucked it up? I believed in one dentist that I actually was an office manager for, for a little longer than I should have. And I should have, I should have made a decision to move on from that quicker. But what I learned from it was to really value the clinical skills of really, really good clinicians. When a dentist is really good, I'll, I'll move mountains for them because I can, I can, I can help a patient feel me to understand the value of what that doctor is going to do for them. That's my current partner. He walks on water. He does things on people and they just don't know what happened. And I'm like, you're not supposed to, but wasn't that good? <laughs> no. So where I misstepped is I probably stayed with some dentists who did not want to grow clinically as much as I wanted them to grow clinically. So I probably stayed too long in some instances. Cool. So I guess it's about knowing when that time is drawing to a close and having the courage to either have a conversation or to make a change. I always chose to have a conversation because sometimes I think in the dentist, it's just a little fear of maybe wanting to go and step it up again. But when you got somebody who says, I, I can, I can go with you. I can sell this with you. Let's go. Then they'll do it. Well, I, I think that's a, a wonderful attribute, and I'm sure Charles is very, very grateful to have you as his right-hand person. That's fantastic. You guys must make a wonderful team. You, you spoke early in our conversation at the very beginning. You said to me, for the first 15 years of your practicing life, you could look at your KPIs, and with a reasonable degree of certainty, you could predict what was going to happen. But in the last five years, certainty has become a scarcer commodity and now there's a whole lot of change happening at warp speed. So given that we can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, how are you preparing for the future? What are you doing in terms of risk mitigation or identifying opportunities? Because as you've already pointed out, and I agree wholeheartedly, is the future is uncertain. But where there's uncertainty, there's opportunity, but there's also risk. So what are you guys thinking in that space? Well, when Dr. Crouch and I discussed this, it's a little shocking statistic that 80% of the patients in the United States choose their dentist today on their insurance. That's a big statistic. So then 30% of the United States are only going to the dentist. So if you only got 30% of the people utilizing your services, making 80% of their decision on what their insurance dictates, you're in a tsunami that nobody really can control. But you can't just fold up shop and put your head in the sand and close up. So it's a very personal decision for each dentist to make if they take some insurance, no insurance, fee for service, what they choose. Our current model is we choose to participate in a couple. Like I tell my team, we've got one visit to totally knock their socks off. We got one visit to make them understand that their insurance should have no say-so in their care. One visit. And our historically, our new patient visit is 90 minutes. So then I break it down further. We got 90 minutes to do this. What are we going to do to make that happen? And then the next year, if their insurance changes, they have another thing to choose from other than just what their insurance company dictates. Now, it's not just about the insurance, it's about the experience, right? You, you're making the decision-making criteria more complicated than just insurance. And we've both been in dentistry for quite some time, and one of the oldest sayings that still is so very valuable 
is people don't care how much they know, how much we know. They care about how we make them feel. And we only got 90 minutes to make them know that we know what we're talking about, but how we made them feel is the most important attribute. And that doesn't just come across with a coffee maker or a fluffy office or those kind of things. It's really connecting with them. So what do you do practically to connect in that 90 minutes? What are the practical things? Because I know someone listening to this podcast is going to say, yes, Jennifer, 90 minutes. But what do you do specifically in that 90 minutes to create that connection, to create that relationship and ensure that the, the patient is going to make their decisions not based solely on their insurance, but now about who I really value and trust to deliver care to me? I can honestly tell you that for the first time in my life, I do this with Dr. Crouch and we do it a lot together still. And then, of course, my staff members, but we put them through, of course, the normal x-rays and, and those kind of things. But we really connect with the human inside. They really know how much we care. When we talk to them, we are stopped and in the moment with them. Nothing else is happening. When Dr. Crouch comes in the room, it's it's like he's there with them. There's He is not disturbed. There is nothing else happening. And we just ask them what they want for their mouth. It doesn't matter if they don't, if we sit there and talk about implants, but they're not ready to hear it. So we tell them, where do you, where do you want to go? Where do you want to see yourself in 10 years? We really have heart to hearts and that's the game changer. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I've been in dentistry 22 years. Dr. Crouch has been in dentistry 32 years. He still loves being a wet dentist. How does that happen? Because we care what we care about the human. We care about the connection. The connection thing is so important. And Jennifer, I really think we're seeing from the same hymn sheet here. I was listening to that wonderful TED talk by Brené Brown, and she goes on to (sighs) say, "Love her, isn't she wonderful?" And (laughs) she's a Texan too, isn't she? Yep, yep. She goes on to say in her book, Daring Greatly, that, and I'm possibly going to misquote, but in essence, she's saying that connection is what gives meaning and purpose to our lives. And I think as we travel at warp speed into a rapidly changing world, it's very easy for, I think, for practices to fall into a transactional mode of care where it's in, out, quick, and we lose that connection. And and what I really agree with what you're saying is by slowing down and taking the time to really engage and to be present, that has a dividend, not just for the patient in terms of them feeling cared and supported, which is the obvious dividend, but it has a massive dividend for the practice as well, because you're, you're investing in loyalty, you're investing in that return visit, you're investing in improved case acceptance down the track, because when we know what the patient really wants at an emotional and at a heart level, we can then give it to them. We can make sure that we're delivering care, which is care, not just dentistry. And honestly, if you slow down in the beginning and you really make that bond, then you can speed up moving them forward because the trust is there. Dr. Crouch can knock out a molar endo in an hour and a half. And they're like, what just happened? And we're like, well, we're done. They're like, oh my gosh, I thought this was going to be three hours or four hours. And they start telling us our horror stories. We're like, nope, we're not that. We're not going to do that. And they just, they trust us so much at that time because we've already built that relationship that basically they just let they just lay there and let us complete them. And it's complete trust. So slow down to speed up later. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Hey, Jennifer, as we're coming to the conclusion of our conversation, I really wanted to just touch on because you, you run a, a group called the Prosperity Dental Practice and the website is the Prosperity Dental But as, as we're wrapping up today, if you were to leave our audience with a couple of key lessons or tips or insights. And I know that life is far more complicated than a series of bullet points. But if there was a couple of key learnings that you did want to leave the audience with, what would be the one or two or even three things that you would say to the audience and say, these are some things that we've learned over the years that have just served us well? I believe that if a dentist really wants to stay in this profession long term, He has to have people around him that he can trust because if the dentist isn't comfortable 
and nurtured and taken care of. He can't do that for his patients. What each dentist needs to have that accomplished could be very individual. It could be a coach. It could be a clinical coach. It could be a team member. It could be any number of things. But a dentist has to make sure that they feel supported in order to support their staff. If you're going to really institute change in your practice and you create a vision and you really want that vision to work, you have to have help with integration. You can't just train. You can't just, the doctor and the the office managers can't go to go to a training and come back and then tell everybody else on the team, this is what we're going to do. That's not team. And so, and I think that we've lost some good people to this profession if they're not empowered and trusted to be in partnership and help that dentist. And I think they're, we're so busy sometimes focusing on the negative side of, yes, bad things happen. Yes, people steal. Yes, people do bad things. But that's not the majority. It's the minority. And I think if you focus on that and you let fear come into you getting a great practice manager as a clinician, that you hurt yourself long term. Could not agree more. Could not agree more. Jennifer, you have been incredibly gracious, you've been incredibly generous, and you've been incredibly insightful in our conversation today. And I really want to take a moment on behalf of all of the audience listening to our podcast to say thank you to you for your insights, your wisdom, and your knowledge. It's obvious that you've got such great breadth and depth of experience in the profession. It's obvious to me that you care enormously for the profession and those that work within it. And from all of us here at the Savvy Dentist Podcast, thank you so much. We genuinely appreciate the time, the effort, and the insights you've shared with us today. So thank you once more. Thank you. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to visit with you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.